Hello, comic book fans, and welcome to another episode of Off the Rack. I'm Sal. And I'm Tiffany. This is a comic book review show where we take comic books from the past week and we recap them, review them, tell you what we thought about them, and then recommend comic books that are coming out this week that we think you should check out. We also like to talk about the news and also comic book related media. Uh, Tiffany and I did have the unfortunate pleasure of seeing Aquaman 2 of the Lost Kingdom, so perhaps we'll talk about that later on in the program. Mm. But for now, I think we're just going to stick with the comics, ladies and gentlemen. Although there is uh, a fair amount of news, obviously, in uh, the world, as there uh, typically is uh, in any industry, comics notwithstanding. Uh, but uh, for now, you, you hear anything? You hear anything through the through the pipeline? No. <laughs> no, no, myself included. I also have not really heard much. I've heard a little bit, but uh, a little bit of rumblings, but um, unfortunately, nothing, uh, nothing terribly pressing. Nothing that I want to jump into. Uh, in any detail, nothing that I feel very passionate about. Okay. So, why don't we, why don't we just stick with the comics for today? Huh? <laughs> Sal's being really sweet. He's trying to be low key because I either have a sinus infection or a cold, and I wasn't even going to do the show. He was going to do it on his own, but I felt like I wanted to do it anyway. Um, so Sal's trying to, you know, make it not so obvious, but like it's okay. You can you can be. You could be you. I don't mind. I think I think it's fine. Okay, I think okay. th this is me. You know? <laughs> this is me. This is low key me. Okay. Okay. But uh, I uh, I should also mention that this show is sponsored by viewers like you. You watching the show live? You can sponsor today's show by making a question or comment uh, visible using super chats, and uh, the proceeds will go to help us out uh, more directly and allow us to continue to do this full time. Because uh, let me tell you something. I uh, I know a few people out there in the real world who are doing real world jobs and having real world lives, and uh, I don't envy them. And uh, they do not have time for funny books. So let's talk about uh, Avengers Twilight number three from Chip Zdarsky and Danielle, or Daniel Acuna. This, of course, uh, is the second issue that I reviewed. I missed issue two, but I did read both two and three. Mm. And uh, I, I should point out that uh, Daniel Acuna's art uh, continues to be impressive and exciting. Um, it has a... Uh, you know, there, there's a consistency with his art that uh, that I enjoy and admire. Um, these covers are exciting and interesting. I really appreciate how, while they're, uh, you know, dynamic, these are not uh, Daniel and Acuna, obviously. I believe oh. they're uh, Alex Ross. But, uh, you know, these covers are uh, dynamic but uh, selective in its decisions. You know, like, this is just a big image of, uh, of, of, of Ms. Marvel in the dark dystopian future timeline of mm -hmm. the Avengers and yet you know simple image of a woman wearing a onesie and yet it uh, manages to impose this kind of like striking uh, tower-esque visual that uh, that I think is important uh, of course the whole book itself is about Captain America getting his groove back doing his his damnedest to bring America back from the brink of uh, dysfunction and fascism which I, I don't know where Zdarsky plumbed the depths of his mind to get that kind of theming, but uh, I'm, I'm 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 really thankful that he was able to do that. Uh, th this story is fine, if not formulaic and expected. Uh, I I can't help, in the most glowing way possible, to uh, but uh, compare it to Dark Knight Returns two. The, the Dark Knight Strikes Again from Frank Miller hmm. uh, because it too seeks to take a older grizzled version of a classic big two icon and bring them into the future and have them uh, assemble a team of colorful characters who may have passed their prime, maybe get a couple of the next generation in on their, uh, their, their crew and then overthrow the evil dictators of the government. And of course, while this would be probably more, I don't know if you want to call it social re responsible. Uh, if it was just about the uh, kind of like disaffection of the American populace mm. uh, and, and just some duly appointed leaders being monsters. No, uh, this issue reveals that in fact, Red Skull is running the deal with uh, Ultron uh, also helping out with the, you know, the day to the, the day to day though, the true villain I think of this series is Tony Stark's uh, bullheaded son. Right. So I totally forgot I read this first issue because I, for some reason, made it into a Captain America book. So I, was I mean, reading, it is a Captain America. But book. I've been like thinking, like, where is that Captain America book that I read? Mm -hmm. and this did, is it. And but I didn't read this because I because I forgot because you it forgot was it was because it wasn't a Captain America book. Yeah. Uh, Captain yes. America continues to, you know, it 
I don't know if you even need Captain America to have lost his super soldier serum and get it back unless it's going to be some kind of a idea later where it burns out of his system or it's not as good as it was or something like that. Like, I think the idea of Captain America just simply retiring would have been just as successful as Captain America having lost his super soldier serum off camera. And then he gets it back only to be this. Like, I don't think he needed to even be old in order for the story to work. You could literally do this story after Dark Reign and right. just say, oh, it's the Marvel Universe, but it's dystopian now. You know, I mean, we were living it in real time. Yeah, but there is like, you know, like we've seen it in other. I, I meant this is meant to feel a little bit, I think, like Kingdom Come or, you, you know. Yeah, it's, it's it, it, it is evoking a lot of imagery that you'd expect from like dystopian comic book. Well, I wasn't just thinking dystopian. I was thinking like, you know, seeing your heroes older. Yes, yes. Seeing where, where they are, seeing the, the generations that came afterwards. And in this situation, there aren't any. Right. You know, and and, and like that, it's kind of neat. You know, it's an it's an opportunity to let characters age when so often they're not allowed to. Right. Unless they're forced to. And then it gets fans really mad about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I fear that the book isn't taking as many risks as it should be. Okay. Um, I, I do find myself excited and happy and uh, entertained by what's happening in the story, though I also question um, why it's not rallying me. And I, the, way, the reason why I compare it to Dark Knight Strikes Again is because, again, similar theming, uh, similar ideas, even similar visuals, and yet... Uh, for whatever reason, and it could just be like the the time from which it came, that book dropped uh, around 2001, around like 9/11, and so uh, it had a different kind of it hit a different it it had a different feel, different hit. Uh, I was in a different place as a person, uh, as were we all. Some of us didn't exist as people, mm. um, especially the, those of us watching the show. But uh, I, I found myself, despite hating it and finding it to be like trite and uh, and one dimensional and uh, just horrible looking. Um, there were moments that just hit that mm -hmm. really, that really rallied me and my spirit and got me like excited and, uh, and you know, in spite of myself. And I find that I like everything that's happening here. I like the creative team. Uh, I just, I just don't find myself rallied. You know, I'm right, not right. along for the ride. I'm watching things happen. Um, Ms. Marvel, <coughs> Ms. Marvel does have, sorry, there's dust in the air. It's, just part and parcel of this studio. <laughs> but uh, Ms. Marvel has a more triumphant moment than like, Captain America still has. Uh, and I think there was also like a, a, a missed opportunity um, to really showcase the reaction. Captain America has a moment where he like takes the mic and tells the American people what's really going on and says like, fight with me, let's go. And then America essentially like shrugs and, uh, while that description sounds like it would be really interesting and juicy and real, it's just kind of happening. It happens off camera. You know, people just kind of go, oh, they didn't really care. Like people tell Captain America like later. Right, right, right. As opposed to seeing people react. Um, though I will say that there was a great holy crap moment on okay. the last page of this book, which does... I think redeem the book or not the redeem the book, but certainly justifies it. Mm. It, it, it. It is a book full of, Oh my God moments. Um, or at least it attempts to achieve those moments. And I think that uh, maybe it's the, maybe it's just the subject matter at the same time, you know, as we are Americans and as we are world weary and as we are inundated with technology and, 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 and monsters, in, uh, you know, in our own clothing, I think that uh, reading Amer Avengers Twilight is kind of like, yeah, Mm -hmm. you'll read it and just go yeah mm -hmm. right 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 and it's just kind of wearying so maybe that's the problem uh perhaps if uh, we were in better times and i was reading this uh, I'd, I'd find myself more inspired i don't know but right, i do right. feel like it's just it's just not hitting the way i think that it definitely wants to okay but it is still a good book i do enjoy the art uh, quite a bit and i like all the dialogue and i enjoy the characterizations i think that all works really well my only issue is i don't I don't know if it is justifying its existence as well as I think I expected it to when it was first announced. Right, right. Okay. So there it is. All right. What else you got? Um, yeah, so I read several books and a couple of books I kind of just read. Through? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to talk a couple about those. 
Invincible Iron Man came out this week, and uh, it's number 15, part of the fall of House of X. Um, we got some idea of what might be going on in this book last week, because mm -hmm. they set these after the events of things we saw last week. Um, but it's still worth a read, because obviously, I, I think a lot of folk are reading this to see what Tony's role in uh, this story will be, but also the relationship between he and Emma. Yes. Um which Tony indicates that like he received a kiss that he's received before, which means like the, the, the goodbye is coming. Oh no. And I'm like, okay, well, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's the fall of, of the house of X. It's, yeah, exactly. I don't um, need you anymore. But also, Duggan's leaving. <laughs> yeah, but beyond that, I mean, I feel like this issue really um, gave fans something they probably wanted to see for a minute mm. um, because obviously Tony's um, tech has been used by the enemy um to create like stark sentinels and and what what is tony going to do about this what is mm. the response going to be right like you know fay long has been uh, an antagonist for the x-men who then became an antagonist for tony as well and um what will his reaction be well i mean if you if you if you don't know a lot about tony stark like me um <laughs> because you, you don't find him to be a terribly interesting character mm -hmm. uh, unless he's played by robert Downey jr who's just a, 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 a charismatic actor yeah and so it's more about the charismatic actor you recognize but you know through that you get to know the character to some degree there's something you assume eventually is going to happen mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with alcohol mm. um but um and and that does happen i mean if you knew tony how, how would he fix this right like what will tony do mm, build a suit right <clears throat> right he's gonna build a, he's gonna build a suit um but as we know when he's faced like larger than life uh antagonists maybe ones that he couldn't possibly as a man face what will he do i don't know well he'll, he'll build a bigger suit oh okay that's like, yeah like a buster of something oh like, okay okay i see like so, a sentinel buster yes mm -hmm. um and 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 i it sounds like i'm making fun of it but i feel like it's a fairly earned moment right at the end of the book when you're like okay here we go yeah like yep good let's see yep. iron man bust some heads exactly some shell heads yeah 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 so and like i said i think this is one of those like post fall of uh uh, X and all, I might go back and read some Invincible Iron Man just because I find uh, his and Emma's relationship to be charming. Just <laughs> two very superficial people who are or are not in love. I don't know. Kind right. of fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely uh, an earned moment mm. to see these Stark Sentinels facing something a little larger. Yes, I dig that. So um, fun, fun I'm very stuff. Very okay with that. Um, and additionally, I also read through uh, some of uh, Dead X-Men number two uh, by, oh, I'm sorry. I should have given the creative team for uh, Iron Man. Oh, it's Jerry Duggan and Kreese Lee. There you go. Thank you for having that ready. No problem. Uh, Dead X-Men number two, uh, written by Steve Fox, art by uh, Peter Gwynn. Gwynn? I apologize. Oh, okay. Uh, Bernard Chang and Guillermo Sana. Mm. Um, so this is a book that I I feel a little like this was again i think i mentioned this before this was an attempt to give a team that didn't get a chance a chance uh -huh. to do something um but right now the the house of x is not really putting out books that don't have something to do with what's going on with the fall yeah like there aren't as many titles as there has been at its like most prolific point mm -hmm. in in krakoa's history um and so initially this book, which is, I believe, only four issues, seemed to be about this team attempting to get a piece of information for Charles Xavier, which they seemingly have. Ah, they've already achieved it. So, so what's the what's point? What's issue two, three and four going to be about? And this creates this issue creates a problem that they can now solve. And I'm not. And that doesn't mean that's all it's going to do. Obviously, it there could be something that comes from this um that they um, are able to utilize in the fight going forward. This is something they pass on to Rachel, who can then pass it on to Charles. Like, I, I don't know. It easily could be. But I thought it was interesting that um, they decided to go this route. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we, we have seen teams like this in other X um, titles. You know, uh, it's not quite Exiles, but I am thinking a little Exiles. They're mm -hmm. hopping through Moira's lives at this sure. point. Rachel's found a way to kind of send them back to her actual previous lives yes um i think or based on the saved like because they were in the moira save engine going through those lives mm -hmm. so regardless they're going to be live hopping and when they get there 
there was a Moira that they ran into in issue one that's kind of followed them through and she's causing chaos. So that she's disrupting their those lives and now they have to stop that. Yes. Okay. So that's what you're going to see. And, and you know, admittedly, it, it's it's a fun chance to explore a couple of what ifs. Like, yes. You know, like Emma Frost is like leader of the X-Men, you know, at a different age point, you know. So you you get that, and again, you get to see a little bit of this team doing something and and getting the opportunity to be heroes. I still struggle with the genetic factor of this and how they came back. I think it's uh, safe to assume that they're not going to explain. I don't think they're going to. I don't think they're going to at all. Um, But if you wanted to see this team do X-Men things, this is the book. Right. I mean, I did want to, like, I had no problem. I'm not like, oh, screw this team. Um... This is a fun team. This is an exciting team. I like Jubilee. You know, I, I you know, welcome the opportunity to get to know some of the other characters and the dynamic that they would bring to the table, interacting with each other, and also being, you know, the forefront team for Krakoa. Um, I don't know if this is enough, depending on what they end up doing. Right. You know, I don't know if it's more like a, and here is your everybody wins ribbon. <laughs> Or not. It or they'll all die again. It depends. It, it depends on where this ends up. But yes. again, it's only four issues, and this was issue two. Right. Um so. so it's fifty percent over. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we have a couple of super chats that I wanted to talk okay, about. Uh, we have Hulk Zilly here who says, Happy Monday, you guys. I love the TMNT episode last week. I grew up watching the 2003 cartoon show, so I was excited to see how much of the show took from said comics. Best wishes to everyone. Thank you very much, nice. Hulkzilla. Yeah, I uh, noticed that a lot of uh, commenters were big fans of the 2003. They grew up with the 2003 show. Uh, some folks were confused because when we referred to the show, people automatically assumed we meant the 2003 show, but now we're referring to the 1987 show. Uh, but I think that was uh, cleared up in context. Uh, MP says, my theory for Zdarsky's Batman run is Joker made Zer sentient by infecting Bruce's brain with the alien parasite from the Lazarus meteor fragment from the Batcave. I think this would be revealed in 146. Interesting theory. I like the idea of it actually having anything to do with Lazarus Planet, thereby justifying Lazarus Planet's existence. I uh, think that's more optimistic than I would be about this at this point. I think that uh, Joker certainly would be responsible for Zurinar. I just don't know if it has anything to do with Lazarus Planet. Uh, Cat Lord of Retreats, uh, South Voice is like a smooth calming ocean that washes away all the stress and anxiety. Here's the opposite of Black Agar Boltagon, whispers Comet Pop Woo. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Cat Lord. whisper it. No, I'm not going to do that. Valifax the sword yes. uh just had an incredible but exhausting emerald city comic-con chatting with the coolest creators like chip sadarsky jerry duggan and many others told chip you guys are the best get well soon well thank you very much well, Valifax. thank you appreciate that thanks for the uh vote of confidence i do appreciate <laughs> the uh the the endorsement man thank you uh, and uh yeah isn't chip a, a sweet and awesome dude i think so um Bryce Harriet says, uh, hey, Sal and Tiffany, your conversations are always very intelligent. You have inspired me to put pitches together now to figure out how to submit them. Wow. That is the rub, ain't it? But uh, good luck to you. Good luck. And it's incredible. Keep it up, man. Um, thank you all so much for your uh, super chats and uh, yeah. And, and your support. Uh, I uh, I read the Penguin number seven from Tom King and uh, Stavon Subic or Steven Subic. Continuing the saga of the Penguin. Um, this one... Uh, clearly the I assume sales are not good based on how Tom King's books essentially just sell themselves. And, you know, DC is tends to get out of his way, but this penguin teams up with the bat uh, lettering at the top suggests that someone uh, at some marketing level was confused or upset that like Batman hasn't really been in the book very much. And uh, we need to like get the readers to understand this is a Batman comic book. I, well, has Batman been in the other books? Batman has been looming and has, in fact, appeared in at least two. Oh, okay. Out of seven. But is he in more of it? He has. This? He is in this one more. Okay. So I'm wondering if it's just they were like, if this is a chance to, like, regardless of how it's selling, just mm -hmm. be like, they bolster sales, like, because Batman. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Uh, I think that they I think that DC counted on this selling because of the combination of Batman adjacent slash Tom King. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's working, but I should continue to say the Penguin is an incredible book and you should be buying it. Uh, I do love it. And it also does that thing that that uh, 
it's a retcon. This book is a huge retcon. It retcons the penguin, and I imagine that both penguin fans are really upset. Uh, but uh, but I I couldn't possibly care less uh, about he's the retcon. He's not actually a penguin. He's a puffin. Uh, he's a puffin. He's an emperor penguin. No, he's in charge. Uh, no, the the retcon is actually kind of delicious. You could see it coming, and uh, King also mentioned it on the show that we did not too long ago. So you know, you knew that was coming if you watched our show. Mm. But uh, the idea is that, um, of course, Oswald Cobblepot was like a bartender for Falcone, and uh, he uh, was obviously always like a psychopath, and he always had delusions of grandeur, uh, but. Um, he's always underestimated. And so uh, even Batman underestimated him and Batman brings him in and uses him to get information on Falcone because Falcone looks over him. And uh, the idea would be that continuously throughout F uh, Penguin's rise, uh, Penguin is using his, uh, you know, ratting on his fellow criminals to Batman to ascend the throne. Uh, Batman and Penguin both concoct in the early days, the idea that um, Batman will facilitate Penguin's rise to criminality mm, mm -hmm. in exchange for taking out bigger characters and uh, more you know and and focusing on the like larger idea of crime like ba batman essentially learns like i need to uh, sanction certain criminal elements in order to take down larger elements mm -hmm. of, of criminality in gotham and uh essentially the uh, question very not Batman. it's very not batman but uh tom king has been doing a lot of very not batman things i cite the uh one bad day riddler story which i would say is the least batman mm -hmm. thing i've ever seen uh despite the fact that i love that book i think the look the, the book looks incredible it's mitch garrett's mm -hmm. incredible looking series uh or one shot prestige book but uh but wraps up with i was really excited for the ending of that book because i was like man how is batman going to figure that oh he's going to be the least batman thing i've ever seen well i guess that's fair <laughs> not that i want that i'm just saying well i guess i don't know what i expected mm -hmm. with this yeah so uh but the question looming is like who's using whom mm. is batman using the penguin to take care of crime or is penguin taking advantage of batman so that he can ascend mm. and mm. Uh, so that that's the question and it's a, it, and it's fun so eventually penguin concocts this concept uh, to batman where he's like people are noticing that i'm the only one who's not getting touched by you so we need to figure out how i can get pinched by you but also keep coming back Mm -hmm. without like going to Blackgate and just getting murdered in prison. Right. And so Penguin's like, we need, I need to be a member of your rogues gallery. If I concoct a persona, like let's say a penguin, then they'll throw me in Arkham instead of Blackgate and I can get out. And so Penguin comes up with the idea for being a penguin and having themes and gimmicks and umbrella stuff and it all is naturally woven into the fabric of who oswald cobblepot is He's but like, the... i just happen to have this seven step plan <clears throat> all lined out with vendors ready to go to produce these things for me yes for no reason oh don't worry whatsoever. about that don't worry about don't worry about why but the actual like story here is that essentially penguin and Batman have theatrical fake fights with each other throughout their history mm. to sell it like those random images we would see when other someone's referring to Batman's rogues gallery or like in, in other books, in like other books, you like see if like you're just a random image of like this penguin time, and, yeah, Batman fought so-and-so and it's like, where, mm -hmm. what is this even from? Right. It's from this okay. or it's from what, Pen what penguin is set up. So like all those stories where penguin was doing random crap that you couldn't care less about and Batman beat him up. Um, they were all in on it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right it's silly like the concept itself is it, it it is very gotham city year one but attempting to be in continuity and not and more batman like mm. a, like a hundred percent more batman mm. of course penguin also finds out who batman really is and he uh hires this character that tom king invents for earlier in the story and we find out how they how, how penguin and he become uh you know simpatico and so so he all he knows who Batman is. Penguin knows who Batman is. He's always known who Batman was. And uh, he also like goes out of his way to have people who know who Batman really is killed so that Penguin is pretty much the only person who knows. Don't like a lot of people at one point or another know who Batman is. Well, that's in the early days. Uh, eventually, I'm sure it just gets too 
big for its britches. And so he's just like, well, I, I can't, I can't kill everybody. After, after Batman Inc., he's like, I mean, come on. Some people are going to figure this out. I, I, I can't. I just can't. But anyway, it, I, I do love the book. I think it's really well written. The art is, of course, impeccable. But uh, but th- this this concept is going to rub people the wrong way. I just know it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but I can't imagine why anyone would be precious about the Penguin. So who cares? Okay. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> What else we got? Um, Wolverine number 44 came out this week. Um, Sabretooth War. Sabretooth War. Ben Percy and Victor Lavelle on writing. Corey Smith on uh, art. Um, yeah, this is a book that uh, some people like and some people definitely do not. Yeah. Um, this issue was a bit of like a the breather issue. You know, like mm. in, if you're watching an action film uh, or even a horror movie, there has to be a moment or a couple of moments throughout the movie to like slow things down for a minute. Yes. So that the next time something occurs, it's big and it, and well, and you, it can, you can feel it as opposed to just becoming desensitized to exactly. constant action and, and violence. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so in this, we're, we're getting a little bit of the aftermath of the attack on the, um, the, the base and where like, you know, Wolverine realizes that like, like a hero is dead and Quentin Quire is dead and like a whole bunch of other mutants are dead. And he's getting his arms put or his hands put back on because they can't wait for them to regrow. Okay. So they're going to put them on well enough and then he'll, his body will take care of the rest. I guess that's interesting. Yeah. It would heal faster if he had the hand yeah. than if he had to it's regrow like, it's it. It's like if your tooth like cracks or pops out and you bring it to the dentist. And yeah. Cup of milk. It's right. just, it, makes, <laughs> it helps. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it's she the aurora is the one who's going to be helping to put it back together Mm -hmm. of course she you know was in a relationship with akihiro yeah so she's having a hard time with it and it just assumes that like logan is moving on to the next thing and the next thing being uh going after Sabretooth and killing him and she's like you know you must like heal on the inside as well that will echo that later on Mm. in which she'll mention that he's just like that you know she mentioned that but the fact is the only scars i care with me are on the inside right of course i was like all right. That's Ben Percy's That's Wolverine. Ben Percy's Wolverine. Um, and I have no problem with that. You know, it's it's yeah, it's very him. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the saber tooths from another dimension got um got held or got uh, left behind. He's just racing through the snowy landscape, and so Domino, Colossus, and Wolverine go after him. Okay. Um, for me, like I, I guess the hyper violence was meant to be. There's like some stuff later on in this issue because every issue has like a moment of violence. Um, or like grotesquery and yes. you know it could be Wolverine who's putting his hands back on but for me it's the fact that this saber tooth kills a polar bear and skins it and then you see a, a tiny tiny version of and I was like okay yeah I know it's a picture it's fine <laughs> but I didn't need that no I didn't I didn't need that. and he does it for nothing because he, he doesn't he, he does it for nothing right because he's just wearing its it, skin and then yeah and then he gets taken down Wolverine nearly kills him and then they're like hey we have to um interrogate this guy yeah and so they attempt to do it and sage attempts to use um her like limited uh, telepathic abilities in order to get a read on him and and nothing she's like there's something there it's blocking him or blocking me wolverine's like we're just gonna kill him like let's just kill him colossus is like just 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 come up let's go for a walk (laughs) right go for a walk come on tavares so um domino says like why don't we try you know torturing him essentially and that's when phoebe shows up and she's like let me help. Okay. And they're like, are you sure? <laughs> Is that a good idea? Yeah. Should we do that? So she goes in there and she sees, you know, the fact that it's like, oh, the reason this is happening is because, you know, Wolverine and Sabretooth have, you know. Had fights forever. They've always had yeah. fights forever and, and, and other such. No, she doesn't see that. Sorry, that's Wolverine remembering that. And Wolverine finally opens up the present that yes. Laura was going to give him. It's a, it's a world's best dad mug. And right. it's a letter from Laura that says like, this you is know, a little hyperbolic. But like we know you're trying and it means something. And Wolverine's like, okay. Uh-huh. And he's, he, it's, he's it's, this is like great image though. Yeah. Wolverine just I do like it. Being like, oh, so when what Phoebe does see is that like you guys threw him in the pit. And I'm like, you guys, Sage and Domino weren't on the Quiet Council. <laughs> you were part of this. Yeah. There's no you. What? Mm-hmm. And that, like, you know, that, like, meanwhile, they were like, you know, X Force was out there also, like, killing people, you know, and they, that was allowed and whatever. But it was like, yeah, kind of. It's more beast, but all right. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, inevitably, they realize that something is wrong 
Mm -hmm. and there's like some sort of like almost like malware like <laughs> psychic malware in his brain and oh, to it, infect what any yeah, and, it, and it's might, gonna uh... it's gonna like kill her and so domino's like screw this and just shoots him in the head right it's just like enough just nope. don't plug it yeah. no more done um as like phoebe's like rested on the floor she sees quentin and like some sort of like either psychic scream or whatever I mean, you have his head yeah and they're holding it um but that he's on krakoa and so basically this that it allows wolverine to know where to go next yes um and he is going alone because no one else is getting hurt right and also because the rest of the team was definitely over next force but i mean wolverine that's the thing like i yeah anyway yeah I, you know this is this is this is going to become probably more predator-esque i feel like he's going to a, like krakoa you know they're for a final there, showdown for a final, yeah. pre presumably but i mean like this is issue what four yeah of like uh i think we got six more oh I, think, I, I think issue 50 is the issue culmination the end, yeah. yeah so this is this is gonna go on we're gonna get a yeah lot. this is not a final confrontation no it's just no, it just at, keeps going yeah yeah no the last issue of uh saber tooth war which is also the last issue of wolverine is May 22nd. Yeah, well, I mean, like, Sabretooth still has plans, and obviously Wolverine's going to try to, like, you know, cut down the, the family. I'm going to put that in, like, some right, like quotes. Right, people that, like, who are Sabretooth directly connected has... with Wolverine. Well, no, but Sabretooth's all... I mean, Wolverine's going to clearly, like, cut down, like, Sabretooth's family, like, mm. the others that he's brought, and then eventually we'll probably have, like, some final showdown between the two of them. Okay. I mean, yeah. That's, that's my guess. That would be a good guess to make. <laughs> if I were betting, man, that would yeah. be the one I would bet on. So, um, I also read, um, Resurrection of Magneto mm. this is another, um, two of four sort of series, mm -hmm. um, you know, bringing Mag like, yeah, Magneto died. Let's bring him back. Right. Like what, how are we going to do that? We don't have a resurrection protocol anymore. How will we do this? Well, we'll utilize, um, you know, the afterlife and magic, I guess, okay. uh, written by Al Ewing with art by Luciano Vecchio. I like this this book. It, it, it's you know, if you want to see Max, Eric, Magnus, Magneto, whatever you want to call him, mm -hmm. um, go through it. This is the book. This is the book for you. You know, he's he's in like a seemingly a hellscape of his own creation in which um, he is faced with a wall of names of those that he has killed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't really think I need to explain to you the iconography of. <laughs> someone with his um background ancestral or like you know cultural background mm -hmm. i i think you 100 get, get that um you know it's more powerful to see him do it than have me explain that to you necessarily no um but well, while all the while being having no eyes and like bleeding from his his eye sockets um so th there's a lot going on there yeah. um it, it it it's very clear that um he feels intense guilt this um and that obviously we're kind of going through different parts of his life mm -hmm. you know in which he has played many roles uh in the marvel universe and you know admits that you know a lot of the people who are dead um some of them he regrets and some he doesn't sure and you know sometimes they died by intent and sometimes by impact you know what i mean like it's just or by accident yeah um and uh he ha he finds no forgiveness for himself naturally storm shows up and um you know they they have like a really intense conversation about you know like the fact that he should absolutely forgive himself and kind of some of the current status of of what's going on because he has no idea he's been dead right right um and uh it's interesting because she this saber tooth also comes up in this too i'm like okay huh? um but she mentions uh that it was through charles's choice and i was like yes sort of mm -hmm. you know right like moira influenced him well also like in the moment and orcus's plan was to send them to araco it was mother righteous who moved everything and moved the needle on yes, that one that's you, true. you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it's just interesting the way that's phrased in this issue but again like i don't really feel like storm had a lot of um say or compassion polar. for charles at this point and you know she's, she's had it. a rocky relationship with him during krakoa yes um so i get it uh but he ends up utilizing the names 
kind of attacking Storm with them. Okay, Again, these are the names of all the people that he's wrong. Yeah, with. yeah, a lot of symbolism there. Um, and each like for some of them that we see him like throw, he like is able to tell you exactly what happened to that person, mm-hmm. like why they died, that kind of thing. Sure. And inevitably, he comes up with uh, Max Eisenhart, and you know he's like, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, he collapses, and that's when Storm's like, I I need you to see something, right? And so she like heals him because we're in because we're in a metaphysical place yeah, that, so where, totally where dreams can fine. happen. He's like, no, I don't want to look. And what it is is it's like the names of yeah all the people he saved, right? right? And right. it's like you know, and he's like, is that enough though? No, even if like for every one I killed, there's a thousand that I saved, and 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 so it's all about like you know forgiveness and and you know reconciliation. Um, additionally, he has a key that he earned in a um adventure he had with namor versus a uh, sea hag um and that key presumably would unlock yeah i remember door. that yeah so uh he still has the key and he busts it out and it's time for him to use it and he's like will it be the path of ease where like a door will open up and i can leave or will it be a harder path to take it's a harder path folks because we got two more issues so yeah. he's got to go through that exactly and then this this uh dark being shows up at the end and naturally my x-men animation brain can't help but make shadow king yeah i don't think that's what it is (laughs) at all um but i i I can't help myself i mean look look at that yeah it's awesome and like storms there and i'm like shadow king oh i don't think i hope so no no it would be weird right Mm -hmm. so you know really good book if you're a magneto fan i don't know how you feel about this but i would assume you like it i would assume you like it too because it's just a really great uh, exploration of his character Mm -hmm. um you know it, it feels like um it's funny like simultaneously in the world of like superhero comics you know we have this like thought or this ideal in our mind of like you know there's good and there's evil right but so many of the characters that we all love tend to walk that line yep. of like sometimes they're not intrinsically purely good right and, and i find that a lot in the world of mutants yes like quite a bit yeah, just there's always most villains become heroes at some point in the X-Men's history. So right. you have to walk that line of like, are they a villain? Are they a hero? Especially if they die and they're facing judgment, which isn't going to happen all the time in a comic book. Right. But when it does, let's explore it. And that's right. just, and, you know. And I don't know if this book is saying at all that it's acceptable what he has done. I don't think it's giving him or like Magneto a pass on killing people when i mean i would hope that people would not assume that based on what he's going through right Right. um and it's not that he's forgiving himself for that i think it's more that he's recognizing that his work isn't done Mm -hmm. and that you know he has done a lot of good and maybe this is more like a cautionary tale like don't go down the other path again like stick to this but like you being here is not helping everyone else. and like honestly you <laughs> right, we being could use here you is going to end up like adding on the guilt like once you know that you're needed in this way if you deny that because you're, you're a, too selfish to like you're in such a state that you're like no i can't like allow myself to help again because i'm such a bad person mm-hmm. but you're actually adding to the pile of things that are giving you that guilt yeah so, exactly and there's a lot here, and I think there's a lot to unpack. Um, yeah. So there you go. Uh, I read What If Venom number one uh, from Jeremy Holt yeah, I completely and forgot Jesus Hervas. book even came out. That's fair. Um, so How I, was it? Oh, uh, you know, it's not bad. Uh, the cover seems to suggest a like multiversal Venom. Um, the actual meat of it is uh, quite uh, the contrary. The idea is I don't know what this is supposed to be. But I would assume a lot of things from reading the first issue and then looking back at the cover, like this first issue is what if She-Hulk became Venom? That's what this book is. Oh, okay. okay. And maybe issue two will be what if Doctor Strange became Venom or Loki became Venom or Wolverine became Venom. But the the end of the first issue implies a continuation of the main narrative. So maybe Venom's going to hop characters in one actual contiguous story but the book makes no attempt to contextualize that outside of what you get and i don't know why they didn't sell this Mm. you know or 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 how they could have dropped the ball on selling it because it's a cool cover but what is it though and it's an interesting concept, but I understand you can't sell what if She-Hulk became Venom as issue one because who cares? 
you know? Mm. And when I say that, I don't mean like no one likes She-Hulk. I'm just saying like, how do you sell that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's bizarre. Um, the second issue cover has Venom being Wolverine. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's where we're going with this is that like different characters become Venom, but there's only four issues of the series and but there's five characters on the cover. Yeah. There? We're not going to do them all. I don't know. It's just weird. I, well, it looks like one of them is Moon Knight. Yeah, Moon Knight is definitely in this book. He shows up. So, wait, it looked like one of them was a Doctor Strange one. One was Wolverine. What was the other one that was the fourth one? Uh, I think it was, uh, it, it, it wasn't Moon Knight. Wolverine, Venom, or Wolverine, Venom, oh, Loki, Loki, Venom, and uh, Doctor Strange, oh, that's Venom. That's interesting. Yeah. Do you remember that? Um, I think it was with anti venoms though, mm. or maybe not. Do you remember there was one where there was a bunch of multiversal ones, and they were different characters, and one of them was like Doctor well, Strange was like, version of it. I I don't I do remember like the what if Miles Morales became like five different characters. No, no, but it was specifically it was part of a, a, another story, and I don't know why I was reading it other than what was it the dark hold series no it wasn't it was specifically it was either a spider-man thing or a venom thing mm. it was a while ago mm. it was a extreme venom burst that's it that's thank it. you there you go yeah man i forgot about that that's a uh, cullen thank bunt thank you thank you thank you that's exactly what it was i there was like go. no i feel like i've seen this concept right well it's uh it's a what if book now yeah there you go um you know the if you ever wanted to see a like weird take on like what if she hulk entered saint Ma like i think it's our lady of saints church before eddie brock like does himself in but before the venom symbiote gets eddie brock like mm -hmm. then i guess this is the book for you it it's so a, is this a universe in which eddie brock Device? doesn't become venom no he oh, he okay. runs away uh like a oh, hero right. but um so here here's what i'm going to talk about instead um there's two things that i have a huge problem with when it comes to this um when it comes to marvel's approach and it all and it's all aesthetic uh the first one is that the venom logo um is the original venom logo from the 90s but they squished it um all they did was warp it they just used a you know they used a photoshop tool and just just warped it so it's a little longer uh, top and bottom than it was that's it they just they just warped the logo they did it for donny cates's run and they just kept it that way i i don't think that that's a uh that, that, that it looks good because it looks wrong because you just changed the original logo well guess made what it longer. to me it doesn't i know because you don't you didn't I don't know it. it. Right. So it's wrong to you. Well, it's wrong to two thirds of the readership. I guess. But uh, but that's but weird. Also, I, I, it's a weird decision. I want to I want to point out that um, uh, graphic designers are allowed to do that as long as you do it in the right way. And as far as I see, there they didn't break anything. They probably used a different way in which they did it. Mm -hmm, I would mm -hmm. hope. I would hope. I wouldn't anyway. expect it to go that way. But uh, only because <laughs> it's Marvel and they you know. But uh, the other thing is the what if branding, which has just completely fallen apart. Um, you know, they they tasked Chip Zdarsky with this idea of like, hey, let's bring back, let's resurrect the what if brand. It's going to get a lot of exposure thanks to the cartoon show. Mm -hmm. um, so Zdarsky makes a logo. He launches a series. It sells very well. People are really excited about it. And then they never follow up with any more what if series again only to then come up with what if dark, mm -hmm. which is literally this what if logo, but with the word dark after it. And they do that, I think, two times. And then they come up with this. And it's just what if it's just the classic what if. And because you have three different what if series in the past five years, you're going to completely throw off your readership, your, your 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 audience and your collectors who are trying to figure out like exactly where what if comes from. I feel like that they're not i think they're just not careful they just don't no, care i just feel like they've realized there probably isn't a readership for what if and so they're banking more on the readership of the character that's exactly what it is but that's they, they did that back during like civil war annihilation when they would just originally when what if was a brand and it was a brand that lasted more than 100 issues i should point out twice um when they were doing the later series or in the earlier series it would be like what if the Avengers lost the high evolutionary war. Mm. You know, it, it takes the concept of like a previous event and then says, what if this happened specifically we're what ifing things that happened in the Marvel universe when civil war and annihilation happened, they were like, Oh, let's just call it that. So it's just, what if annihilation? Yeah. It's just, what if, but the book, mm -hmm. 
okay. And I think that was their way of trying to like square the circle of like, let's keep making what if, but let's bank on like the recognize the, the recognizability of, of a brand. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, well, but I don't want to do just what if events. I want to do a what if story featuring a character. So it'll be what if Wolverine. But what the hell does that even mean? Right, right. So yeah, no, their their branding is just completely off, like off the rails when it comes to what if they just don't know what to do or how to sell it, or they don't remember. Either way, it just drives me crazy. I'm sorry. I know because I know you like what if. I do like, like what I if, and I think it's like fun. In there for you, it's just a good idea, and 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 I think that it, you know, it's a self fulfilling prophecy when this book doesn't sell because it's like, well, but you're. It would be like if like a you know a pair of kids had a lemonade stand and all they did was scream at you and throw water balloons at you and they're like i don't understand why we're not selling lemonade and it's like maybe your marketing strategy's off so okay. uh yeah okay Fair. yeah uh what else did you read i read the flash naturally this week issue six everyone's uh, favorite incarnation of the flash written by simon spurrier with art by mike david jr i really like this i know, book, I know. and i and, and i i'm actually very interested to see how people feel about it post this issue mm-hmm um i saw some chatter about this and i didn't read it i have no idea what oh, okay. what it is I but i know. do but i did see flash fans talk about this and go mm -hmm. oh i think i kind of like this now yeah there's a lot going on here um in particular like this is a really great example of when a comic story and art are real i mean there are lots of great examples mm -hmm. um are, that really just like uplift one another and really support one another because you know, I could explain to you, like, in this story, um, The Flash, you know, like Wally West, The Flash, uh, wears, like, a classic Flash suit throughout, right? Because he's taken on the legacy. Um, and then Barry Allen, The Flash, shows up wearing the same suit. And it has, like, impact, right? Like, you kind of maybe feel like, oh, yeah. that would make the other person feel badly. But when you see it and you start to lose which Flash is which... It brings this greater impact mm -hmm. of what Wally might be going through. Yeah. Because you're going through it as you're trying to figure out who <laughs> like, the hell I can't is tell who. the difference. And it's like, hmm, isn't that a problem? Right. I was like, damn. Yeah. Like, damn. Um, additionally, I absolutely love um a lot of the like uh treatments of uh speech balloons and narration in here. Yeah. You know, like it, it's just like it's just so well done. But I mean, that's just I don't know. There, there, there's like a specific uh, who's the letterer on this? Hassan Ostmain, uh What is that? Oh, uh, El, El Hal, maybe uh, doing a really great job yeah. of, of just not only layout because it's like it's a size barrier book. There's often a lot of um, talking, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. The, there's just it's it's just it's great it's great um but yeah in particular like uh the fact that linda's speech narrations are like um piece of a book or an article yes because like, she's a writer yeah um I, I just i love it you know exactly who that is um right. and just getting into her mind and you know you like we have this like this these two like you know wally to me was always fun and just you know not um super mature necessarily mm -hmm. and uh you know he's taken on this role and he has a family and he's trying to do everything and he's seemingly trying to keep it together and linda had flash powers and now she doesn't have flash powers and now she's just herself and she's raising a, like children right mm -hmm. and uh, we really get an insight to their 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 minds here all the while there's some sort of strange I don't know how strange it is because I don't really read a lot of flash. Right. So I'm just like, I, this could either happen to them all the time, just mm -hmm. random crap showing up, just random mm -hmm. weird things. Sure. Um, but yeah, the, you know, presumably this is like some strange occurrence here involving running yes. and the speed force and other such things and things that look like the flash. Right. I actually really like the look of them. Like it's just really, really well done. Um, and the fact that, you know, Jay, Jai? Oh, his daughter? No, son. Son, sorry. Uh, however you want yeah, to... I, I always say Jai. Yeah. Um, how he has decided he doesn't want to be a hero? Yes. You know, it's just, there's a, there's a lot of, like, things that as a regular person who is not a superhero um, can relate to. Mm -hmm. And I really think it helps to, I don't know, it really endears me even more to Wally. Yeah. 
and, and to his situation. And even though, you know, I, I don't, I don't have like a, like, I think it's fun. Like the idea of like the speed force and running, but I've never really, like, it's never been enough for me to go like, I'll and, read the flash now, now. Read the flash now. And, but I do understand people who like the flash typically, mm -hmm. you know, like I, I get it. It's a cool power set. It's, you know, you have to think about it a different way in which you're going to handle your, your rogues gallery, you know, there's potential for time travel or this or that. Like I totally get it, but this really has like made me go like, cool. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I really, I like where this is going. Yeah. Um, and of course, Wally himself is utilizing his like strange ability to like sidestep into like another place to like avoid reality mm -hmm. uh, sometimes. Right. Um, which is revealed to Linda that he has access to this. And then when he realizes she's there, because it was kind of accidental, he's like, oh, uh, yeah, so this is the thing. And, and like, don't worry about it. And takes her back. And I love the way she like um, describes it. Um, cause she's like, it's, you know, this like Eden, right. And uh, you know, before he pulls back like a possessive child with a new toy mm. like, and I, I was like, oh yeah, that's true. Like, you know, you, you've gotten something new and you kind of like, maybe you don't want to share it with everybody. Yeah. And that's what he's going through right now. And, mm -hmm. and she now recognizes it and maybe she could use it as well. But regardless, like at the end of this, like, this is probably the reason why everybody oh, the last page, is yeah. talking about this book. Right. And I, I love this, like calling it that. That's like cheeky wordplay. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Needless yeah. to say, if you, if you're, if you fell off of this book, um, there's mention of a crown, a crown of thorns. Yes. So, um, you know, if that's enough for you, I want to jump back on it. <laughs> yeah. But this book always makes me like, leaves me like going, like, did I fully understand this? And then I realize sometimes I won't fully understand it until, until you see the whole picture. Until I see the whole picture, which, yeah. It's great. I, I again, I think this is an excellent book. I think it's really well written. Um, and um, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully, Flash fans are either getting something out of this or are checking out some of the other Flash offerings that have been coming out uh, concurrently with this. Right. Uh, Dan V nine hundred says somehow I didn't know that Newburn existed by Chip Zdarsky and Jacob Phillips. I picked up the fifteenth issue and really liked it. The art was great. It's funny that you mentioned that. I didn't read that book, um, but I did take pause on it because Newburn has often had incredible cover game yes uh and i and i while shopping for my comics digitally um i couldn't help but note you know it's just it's very simple but mm -hmm. it's it, because of that because of its simplicity yeah it's just it's very eye-catching so it's really it's literally very it's very funny that you pick that up because right. i was like oh neat look at that yeah mp uh my zero parasite theory isn't related to lazarus planet it's the meteor bruce found years ago and battling rachel ghoul mentioned in gotham war okay uh thank you very much uh, the well, Space the Cowboy. That, I did. I was oh. the one who messed it up. Yeah. You didn't mess it up. Uh, the Space Cowboy. Hope my favorite comic YouTubers are doing well. I think so. You, you, you're feeling a little bit under the weather. But I you'll am be getting there. The <laughs> uh, I've been behind some books, but I'm trying my best to keep up with Spider Man and uh, Action Comics, Thor, uh, NW. I don't know what that is. Strange and Iron Man. Thoughts on Absolute Power coming later this year? Actually, we did a whole uh, conversation about it in the last episode. But uh, Absolute Power sounds great. Dan Moore and Mark Wade, yeah, it's uh, one of the best books from DC Comics right now and I, in World's Finest, so why not? Uh, Joshua Vaughn, finally, The Rock has made it back to a live show. Um, I guess so, yeah. The uh, Cat Love and Treats, uh, curious well, what welcome. the. Yeah, yeah right? Uh, what the odds of seeing X Men 92 version of Hawks on back issues. Since it's coming back, honestly, I want to see Ethan and Ben react to it. That's the, yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, Maybe. I feel like Sal's got a bigger ask for other Kirk Cohen books before that. Meh. Okay. I mean, it is in its own universe, so it could be it's it, it could be quicker. That's true. I just feel like sometimes without context for what's going on, I don't know if it'll have the same impact on them. Mm -hmm. But maybe it would. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Mm. Ray Farr, Kampa Wu, a long uh, while ago, I was at my local comic shop and giggled when I saw a What If Dark issue and couldn't help but think Tempest Fugonaut was watching me. <laughs> exactly. Because uh, Tales from the Dark Multiverse is just dark, justly dark. Love that. Noah Kennedy, good evening, Sal and Tiffany. Just uh, popping in to say I can't wait for the human target on back issues and that Tom King is an absolute treasure to meet. He is a lovely he guy. He is a nice He's person. A nice person. Mean, absolutely. Ray also says, could we see more since we three on the couch? Nope. No. Nope, you can't. No. Uh, we also uh, have uh, a couple other books. We got Green Hour number nine, Josh Williamson, Sean Isaacs. Uh, this, of course, is, uh, as the episode seems to imply, or maybe just outright say, Green Hour is the most important DC comic. 
that's because uh, I was shocked to see how much of the DC current status quo was referenced and paid off or implied in this issue. Uh, I was just reading it because Green Arrow is just a really good series overall, and I've been enjoying it. Even though I'm not the the world's biggest Green Arrow fan, I I endeavored to give it a try, and uh, the art's been fantastic, and the story's been really fun, mm. and uh, it's been kind of setting up Ollie uh, to re-inherit the, the entire Arrow family and implies like maybe there's some greater forces at work keeping it at bay. And then finally things are uh, coming together when uh, we find out that Roy uh, is off uh, off the grid and uh, seemingly working for uh, Amanda Waller. And so um, Green Arrow is uh, in investigating. I've been reading a bunch of these books. I've been reading Superman and uh, Batman and uh, World's Finest and so forth. So I feel like I, I have a pretty good beat on what's going on in the DC universe, mm -hmm. especially with respect to the Dawn of DC series. And then I read this and I'm like, oh, I uh, didn't actually know that any of these things were going on. Like, for example, Mena Waller took control of the uh, Hall of Justice and has been packing up everything that belongs to the Justice League and moving it out uh, and taking it to some place that no one knows about and has taking complete control of the watch or of the uh, of the hall of justice with uh two foot soldiers in the form of peacemaker and peace wrecker a female version of peacemaker and okay i didn't know that was happening uh i i saw those characters but i didn't know that was going on um, also multiversal cyborgs are uh are, are their muscle and um so green arrow decides to break in to find out more and a lot of like who's who of what's what and a lot of fun like references like for example uh, batman has an interrogation chamber in the uh in the belly of the hall of justice we know that because he uses it specifically to keep the batman who laughs but the batman who laughs got away and uh died i don't remember anymore i read that series a long time ago who cares oh that's right he became document at men batten and blew up uh what matters is he's gone but oman waller's using it now you know because it's like and it's designed by batman to hold the worst Batman in the multiverses. So it's like, oh yeah, no, that's a good prison to have. And mm -hmm. so Ollie breaks in, he gets waylaid, they put him in the interrogation chamber and basically uh, Ollie asks Amanda Waller, like, what the hell's going on here? She explains like, you know, he broke the law. I put him in, I put him in my own little version of a suicide squad. Now he's doing stuff for me. I, uh, you know, I was on another earth uh, a little while back. You might not have remembered it. Uh, and so, and I saw the whole world fall apart and superheroes were either the cause or at least they weren't useful. And so I've changed my tune. I think superheroes are bad powers are crap and I want to take it all down. Uh, so, you know, maybe we could work together and he's like, well, as long as I, I'm never going to do that, but I am a sucker for my family and for, you know, my wayward kids like Roy. And so I'm going to like protect him. What do we have to do? And she's like, oh, I'll, give, I'll, I'll give you the whole damn store about like, Roy and you know some of your villains and all this crap if you go and steal something for me and he's like oh, okay what do you want me to steal and uh, the big reveal is that she's like I want you to steal secrets the secrets of sanctuary from friggin heroes in crisis I thought we were all agreed that we were just going to pretend like that didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I also was like, wait, didn't they reveal everything? Like didn't, uh, didn't sanctuary like have a big like doctor uh, or Ozzy Mandeus moment where uh, they revealed everything from sanctuary, but maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's other secrets there. Deeper I'm sure secrets. there's, I'm sure there are. I'm sure we're going to find out there are, but I love that concept because it's like, this is a good use of retconning where it's like, Hey, here's the thing you didn't like, but you all read. Hmm. Let's mm -hmm. use that. Mm -hmm. Let's maybe even justify it a little bit. It's like, it's what comics do. It's what comics have always done. But because there are YouTube channels now, like people are like, I hate that. <laughs> and it's like, okay, all right. Well, I think it's funny that like we're using Heroes in Crisis as like a plot point in a Green Arrow book. Uh, and, and why the hell not? But like, yeah, no, uh, all the secrets of all the superheroes ever in the DC universe are uh, going to be pilfered by Green Arrow. How's he going to get around this? Is he going to give them to Amanda Waller? Is he going to pull a double cross? Who knows? That's mm. that's a fun concept. And uh, and because you all have context for it, you all don't have any excuse not to read this story and see where it's going or or understand what references we're making here. I suppose that's true. She also mentions the fact that she uses the uh, a clandestine group of hackers to uh, take control of the security systems for the Hall of Justice in the form of the Cyber Rats. Now, uh, if you are not a fan of uh, Bloodlines, like many people uh, who either never heard of it or hated it, uh, then you might not know who the Cyber Rats are. Well, the Cyber Rats, uh, PSY, by the way, of course, uh, as 
would be the spelling. How would you uh, assume uh, it wouldn't be? But uh, the Cyber Rats were introduced in a book, I believe it was Robin Annual 2 in 1992 or 3, uh, in which um, a, a spinal fluid sucking alien bites a girl uh, named Razor and turns her into the T-1000. Uh, she is a hacker on a, men, on a team of people uh, called the Cyber Rats. And what they do is, uh, the, the, I think Chuck Dixon wrote, saw hackers recently, and he was like, yeah, hack the planet. These people, they're, they're teenagers who are good at computers, and they also love extreme sports like hang gliding and parachuting and stuff. And so I'm going to put a whole bunch of them into little uh, matching uniforms and have them hack the planet. And then one of them turns into the T-1000, so who cares about them anymore? <laughs> and then uh, I think they had a book. There was like a four-issue miniseries, I think, back in the, the 90s. For the Cyber Rats, if you were ever interested in reading about them, they did exist. They did have a book because back in the day, they made a book about everything. Gunfire had a book. And so did the Cyber Rats. Uh, I don't think the Cyber Rats lasted as long as Gunfire. Even still, uh, I think they all died. I think Superboy Prime killed all the blood, all the new bloods. And I believe most of the Cyber Rats also died. Oh, um, but this book was like, no, nah, they didn't. They were just they're just oh, here. Just, they, never mind. They just and, and Isaacs just drew all of them. And I'm like, eh, thank you. Thanks for bringing them back. I love that. It's just a little fun thing. Like, let's write that wrong. Okay. Because Jeff Johns is like, oh, if it was invented after like 1955, like, I don't give a shit. Unless it's Guy Gardner. Guy Gardner's cool. He's cool. I want to bring him back. But uh, but all that 90s stuff, psh, I wasn't reading comics. So anyway, uh, but yeah, it's a fun book. It's just like, oh, wow. Like, what a little like who's who of 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 of. of of references, but also mm -hmm. making them, weaving them into the greater narrative of, of today. Um, so that's fun. I was like, all right, way to go. You keep scrolling past this Thor cover and it just makes me think it's um, He-Man's battle cat that yeah. he's fighting. And then I was like, where's that? Oh, Thor, Thor versus He-Man? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, where indeed? You know, Marvel had the uh, Master of the Universe license for a hot second. Yeah. Long ago. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, okay. you know, Thor basically is him anyway. That's what I'm saying. Um, but uh, getting back to the Super Chats. Okay. Um, Alex Lawrence says, uh, Josh's Dark Ride concludes this spring. Woo! Yes, uh, Dark Ride from Image Comics. Really fun, uh, hor whimsical horror, you know, resort park story i read the first arc and i liked it enough but i dropped off on it unfortunately okay. uh thorn identity says uh what is the obsession with tempest fugonaut also finger guns for no reason no oh, no not any not no reason jeff johns uh tempest fugonaut sucks he's a stupid character and he shouldn't exist and he's like obvious and complicated and he insists upon himself he, he's everything i hate about a new character um but He's like 30 years late to the party. Like you may, the Tempest Fugonaut would be a dime a dozen. You put him on a team of characters in 1994. Mm -hmm. And yet someone had the audacity to invent him in like 2012 or 14 or something. I was a, it, it, like, what, what is this? And it was just kind of like a, uh, it was like Captain America being told by Coulson that like, he's going to wear a Captain America costume. And he's like, isn't that a little old fashioned <laughs> with like a little bit of sadness in his heart. Uh, Tempest Fugonaut is just a dumb, ugly stupid character that is unnecessary and i think that's so funny and audacious that they even that, that they had that they had the gall to invent him and then put him in things and then that someone thought he'd be like okay well he's not a good antagonist for sideways because no one's going to read that book anymore that's books canceled so let's put him as the watcher in our in our what if ripoff comic mm. that you could guess the ending of every single issue because you know it's in the dark multiverse so it has to have a bad ending mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's like your concept which is inherently flawed has an inherently stupid protagonist or or ride along character in the form of Tempest Fugan. I think that's hilarious I just I, I metatextually think that sucks and also is ironic and fun and and I am like I'm like disappointed and I keep bringing him back because I want I want to make him exist in the world. Mm -hmm. Like I heard he, and I know I read the issue. He was killed off. Like he was killed off panel in a backup action comics story. And internally at DC, that is Tempest. You he is dead. Mm -hmm. And it's like, man, like, no, 
you got to own your mistakes. You got to print your omnibus of bloodlines. You know, you have to like, you have to stand by, if you want to be like, ladies and gentlemen, we made the killing joke. It's like, yeah. And also Armageddon 2001, you know, yeah, you invented, well, you didn't, invent, you know, I was going to say, oh, you invented static, but like, no, <laughs> DC had nothing to do with static. No. But, uh, you know, you invented all kinds of fun, new characters that people really love. And also Tempest Huguenot. And, and you got to own it. And it's like, I just, I, I'm, they, they, they did such a rollout with Tempest that I was like, why stop there? Where's the statue? Where's the action figure? Where's the build a figure? You know, when, when Mattel had the license for DC, like you were whipping up all kinds. There's a Reaper figure. We have him. He's over there. Like there's a Reaper figure from the worst, one of the worst Batman sequels of all time. Uh, Batman year two, the circle chase. I don't remember. I'm, mer I'm merging all my titles, <laughs> but like, you know, where's my Tempest? You can build a figure. You know, you clearly made him because you thought he was rad looking, you know, so why didn't you sell me a figure of him? Anyway, you want it too badly. I do, That's you know, but this is the show where I said that the best way for like both Marvel and DC to like make some scratch and promote the new X-Men line is to cross over. I think it's JLA X-Men and have Jim Lee draw it. and what, like a month later, they said they were doing omnibuses of both the Marvel DC crossovers and Amalgam? And everybody told me that that was impossible and was never going to happen. And then Jim Lee drew I, the cover for it. I think there's a really big difference between that concept and a Tempest Fugonaut uh, figure. Stranger things have happened. I mean, at the very least, maybe somebody could make some hero clicks of Tempest Fugonaut. <laughs> Just something. I don't think they make hero clicks anymore. Uh, Flywheel Shyster, uh, good vibes. Thank you very much. Thank you so Same much. to you, my thank friend. You, thank you. Uh, Last Starfighter, Joshua Williamson is a genius. I love when comic writers attempt to fix mediocre events to open up more stories. That's exactly my point. Not that necessarily he's a genius. I mean, you know, he'll tell you as much. But uh, he, he, I love the idea of taking something that like people hate and then turning it into something else. Um, I think Josh said this on the show that we make together, All Stars, uh, where he's like, you can tell he's going to leave if bloodlines gets a sequel <laughs> and it's like but like he's not gonna do it to like fart in the elevator before he gets off on the next floor like it it's because he's like no people don't like bloodlines i'm gonna elevate bloodlines i'm gonna make i'm gonna like make it. it work and i'm gonna, I'm gonna take this like this it. thing that sucks and i'm gonna make it like matter to somebody and it's like that's that's exactly what you do when you are working for the big two comics you are contributing mm -hmm. you know it's very easy to kill characters. It's very easy to have like a big crisis event and then have your invention show up. And then as a like mouthpiece for the audience you're making fun of murder 90s characters. Uh, and it's harder though to go like, but what if we made them into hackers <laughs> <laughs> that facilitated Amanda Waller's infiltration of the Hall of Justice? I feel like the difficulty, the lift there is remembering them. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Uh, MP, uh, I've been really enjoying Josh Williamson's Green Arrow. It's my first Green Arrow run. I've now gone back and started reading Mike Grell's run. Nice. It's a good run to read. You know what else is a good run? And I hate, I, I not a hes hate to say it, but I hesitate to say it. The, the Kevin Smith run is a really fun Green Arrow run. It's worth reading. There Quiver. Check it out. Um, but yeah, the Mike Grell run is good too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, man, uh, we also, uh, oh, uh, so I also read, and I wanted to mention this because I had a chance to uh, get a copy uh, of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Last Ronin 2, the first issue of uh, of, of that run. <laughs> yeah, oops. Oops. Uh, yeah, I read this. Uh, it's a, it's, it's, it comes out, I believe, this week. So you can check okay, out this, so this book. A it's a preview that I was given carte blanche to basically like to essentially review it. And so here we are. You get to you get to hear about this. Um, I'm going to reread this because I really need to. Mm -hmm. um, the Last Ronin 2, obviously a huge book from IDW. Well, the Last Ronin. The Last Ronin, I should say, yes. Uh, last Ronin was a huge book from IDW and for the Turtles. And I think it was uh, just a, just an overly, o overarchingly like, celebrated book from, uh, the, you know, people just loved it. And they were just happy to get like this, this concept of like Eastman and Laird had this idea for like a Dark Knight Returns for the Turtles. And here it is. And then they, they had this like vexingly, oddly printed run of the series. Um, but, uh, you know, paying homage to a lot of like the inspiration for the turtles. And then it makes sense that we're getting another 
last Ronin book. Mm. Uh, this first issue introduces you to the new turtles. Uh, of course, because the idea, uh, uh, spoilers for the last Ronin, I don't want to spoil it for you, but like it's, you know, all the turtles don't make it. And uh, mm -hmm. we get a new generation of turtles, but they're mm -hmm. baby turtles and they're being infused with the TCRI, uh, you know, ooze uh, to make a new generation of turtles. And then we meet them like 15 years later. Mm -hmm. Here we are uh, with Uno, Moha, Yi and Odin. Uh, and yeah. Um, so let's talk about the good for IDW's The Last Ronin 2 re-evolution. Um, this series looks fantastic. Mm. Um, it is uh, written, of course, by Tom Waltz uh, and is giving credit to Kevin Eastman with art by uh, Ben Bishop uh, and Asao Escorza and Isaac Escorza. Um, it looks great. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it presents a world that is both familiar and uh, dystopian, uh, not unlike the old uh, Last Ronin series, uh, which, of course, pictured this kind of like fusion of Western and Eastern influences and made this kind of like ninja inundated world. And now we're in a post, uh, you know, toppled regime world of like chaos and yet uh, also order. And uh, the, the art looks great. The characters look uh, fun and uh, the designs on the turtles is very deliberate. And, uh, you know, the new turtles that is. Mm hmm. And and each character you get a, you get a sense of like who they are just by looking at them, mm -hmm. and uh, the, you know the layout of the of, of the issue is uh, you know is, is is good as well. Okay. Um, the, the book is called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: The Last Ronin Two Reevolution, which I think should really be a good indication as to like what it's like to read this. There's a lot of words in this title, and not all of them are necessary. And uh, and that's that's my review of this book is that uh, there's a lot of words in this book and not all of them are necessary. And most of them aren't necessary. Um, one of the best fun parts of like a sequel or of fiction is that like, you know, when you're doing a genre, you don't need to like explain it. Or over explain it, you know, part of the fun of like a, a sequel is that the audience is familiar with the characters. You can kind of hit the ground running. Uh, that's not really what this book does. Uh, this book spends painstaking effort introducing you and reintroducing you to its world and its characters. And it's like, hey, everybody, you probably didn't read Last Ronin. And I'm like, whoa, no one's reading Last Ronin 2 without having read Last Ronin. It's and if possible they could have, because if you hear enough hype about it, and you're just like, all right, I'm going to get on the ground floor with this one. Yeah. People do that. Yeah. But even if you did, it, it it's very indulgent. It's an indulgent book. Is my problem with it. Hmm. You know, like there's a, it, it's setting up a new world. It's giving you new characters. There's a sequence in which the turtles tele telepathically communicate with each other and tell you the origin of the Ninja Turtles and the world that it comes from. And then it also has to recontextualize the last Ronin and all that story. So you get two double page splash flashbacks to the context for the world we're in. Well, I mean, that could be. I mean, obviously, this is a, this is a sequel because it takes it's a place straight in up that sequel world, right? to and, and, the last Ronin, right? Exactly. But it might also be that they're treating it like simultaneously, like a new opportunity to create a new team oh, and it's... to introduce people who maybe aren't Turtles fans to something that they can just be on the same playing field as like fans. Oh, the, the the thing about this book is exactly what you're what you're keying into, which is that this this could easily become its own separate universe with a cavalcade of characters and it it could rival slash run alongside the new relaunch of mm -hmm. the Ninja Turtles line mm -hmm. where it's like we got eight turtles, two teams, two universes that look completely different from each other right and this one makes a takes a lot of 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 work scaffolding it into what you want what it wants you to understand it is mm -hmm. and as much as i respect the world building i i, I could use a little more fun and a lot less context okay I guess, I guess maybe 
so like maybe this book is more for people who are hardcore comic book like turtles fans right they're gonna read it no matter what because that's the thing and also for people who are maybe new to it and people like you who are just who dipped in really like last ronin and wanted that maybe this is less oh it's gear it, like maybe this issue is maybe not the whole book overall, it could yeah i don't know all i can this, do is judge it by the first issue but like right or maybe it's just like they don't re- think that people read it as recently as you did and they're like hey let's <sighs> I mean, a little reminder, folks. They definitely need to because it took a long time for the sequel to come out from the release of the first of, of the first series. Mm-hmm. But like the last Ronin is, it can be read in a vacuum. It can be read it like at any point. Mm-hmm. You really don't need any context for it outside of knowing who the turtles are, mm-hmm. and uh, and that was a lot that that had a lot going for it. The sequel is, it's it has the the burden of being a sequel to like a great selling alternate reality take on the turtles mm-hmm. and also setting up a new world and a new set of characters. And it's doing a lot of work. I think that like, doesn't feel like it's honoring its, its predecessor. Like the predecessor is just like, here's this thing. Boom. It exists in a vacuum. It works. It, it, it is its own thing. This is, it's not, it's not that at all. This is setting up but essentially a new line. Yeah. It, like th- this could be a conceivable series of like you could read a book starring each of the four turtles or Casey's daughter or Casey's like, it's uh, the I'm ultimate sorry. turtles universe. Yes, yes, it could be like a like like Hickman's ultimate universe for the turtles. That is a very complimentary thing to say about that. So like, let's just put it that on the on the book. But uh, yeah, this is like essentially the tur- it's it's the ultimate turtles, but also in continuity, but for a out of continuity series. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, but, but if you but if you are a big fan of like an interconnected universe that has a lot of history and characters, like yeah, this is, if you're a well, comic book fan, yeah, it's way up your alley. Well, and the, maybe they're also maybe their market research showed that a lot of people who weren't fans of like or longstanding comic book reading fans of Turtles picked up Last Ronin. Definitely. And so this is an opportunity for them to keep them going in something that is more of an ongoing. Again, we're shooting this from one issue, and I didn't even read it. I'm just going off of what he's no, telling. No, yeah, me. yeah. Um, but maybe it's an opportunity um, to to bring people into the fold, and so like they felt like they're like this is a chance for education because maybe they thought that when they first put out Last Ronin, it was only going to appeal to turtles fans. Turtles fans, and when it had this broader appeal, they were like, "This is a chance. Yeah, let's take it. Absolutely. Like I, I don't know." But maybe that's what it is. Yeah. I, I, uh, it, it also, yeah, it just, it, it feels more like an in universe big two comic book than a, like, this is the next, like, biggest, boldest out of continuity turtle story. It right. is, it is very much a hard continuity new universe kind of story this okay. is it is very much you, you you really hit it where it's like it is launching a new universe hmm. last ronin was like the dark knight returns for the for the ninja turtles franchise last ronin 2 is the ultimate universe for the turtles and that could be very appealing you absolutely know? Again, and i think like it should be you know how long has the turtle comic been running with the idw one yeah or like just on and off like how many years of 40 comic? years yeah it's, this year it's 40 years so it's like that's a lot if you like read last ronin you know you may not be inclined to go like and now to read the rest but this might be feel like you feel like you're like oh okay well everyone doesn't know where this is going mm-hmm. so isn't that exciting you know you're, you're you're touching upon something very uh salient because i think like uh with last ronin it's like non-comic book readers just turtles fans people who buy turtles figures or people who live eat and breathe turtles like the next mutation tv show like just people who who are turtles fanatics Mm -hmm. probably almost certainly read last ronin and then the ones who stayed and read comic books this series is for you Mm -hmm. because it is it is a comic book Mm -hmm. right right. like in every respect um so yeah you know like it it didn't it didn't appeal to me the way that the last Ronin appealed to me. Mm-hmm. But I think don't discount it. It will definitely but it will appeal to you if you are a if you are a like big two reader. Okay. And you're looking for a new Turtles universe that right. doesn't star the, the original Turtles at all. And you want to like get on the ground floor for a new generation of Turtles. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> uh, so let's recommend some comics that are coming out this week that we think you should check out, right? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Whoops, I forgot. We also talked about Aquaman. We, we saw Aquaman. We did. I guess you want to talk about that really quick? Sure. 
It's all Aquaman 2, The Lost Kingdom, directed by James Wan, starring Jason Momoa and Patrick Bateman. If you have HBO, it's out on HBO right now. Yeah, it's on HBO Max. It's on Max. It's on Max. Fart. Um, Yeah, this, you know, uh, this was, this felt really safe. This felt like a movie where most of the cast realized that they were never going to be playing these characters again. Yeah. (laughs) It's, um, I've seen worse. You know what I mean? Like this is this was in no way like offensive or like genre breaking or like a devastating movie. It just kind of sucks. So here's here's why I say I, I, I'm not going to say I've seen worse or not, because I, I don't really think about like tears in my brain. This movie, unfortunately, made me not care. And I think I did not. Even, care. I think that's even worse than sometimes being bad. Yeah. But it's yeah. like I just I just. Right, I just don't. It, I, I don't care. It felt like watching a Sony movie. It felt like watching Morbius, or or I presume it, Adam Webb. I've it never did seen. Feel it. a little like that, you know. Like and 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 Momoa is like maybe not. It's not the same type of charis- charisma as I was talking about with Robert Downey Jr. But he brings like an energy to the screen, and and even he, I was just like, yeah, he was just sleepwalking through this just, thing. I just nope. Or like, or he was just not like he was just being Jason Momoa. Yeah. He wasn't even trying to be someone else. Yeah. Um, and you know that's a shame because Black Manta was given more to do in this than he was previously, yeah. but also he was possessed by an evil spirit, so yeah. it's like he was he didn't even have agency. No, and like it, it sucks too because like he looks like what he like he looks like the character. He looks exactly like Black Manta, and it's like man, you you remarked on how uh, like how rare that is, mm-hmm. where it's like Black Manta is a very hard design to nail down. Like some yeah. artists can't even depict Black Manta well. This movie was like, here's Black Manta as he looks in the comic books on screen, and you're not laughing at him. Yeah, like he looks cool and imposing and interesting. Uh, unfortunately, and and what 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 the, I think the problem is like, you know, in the trailer we have a moment where Black Manta goes like, I'm gonna kill Aquaman and everyone he loves, and it's like that's his motivate. Like, uh, my dad was a bad person, and Aquaman let him die. And so now I'm, and I'm a bad person too. And I'm going to get revenge on my bad person, dad getting killed by a superhero. Yeah. And it's like, I don't, but then I, I'm gets, not with you, man. Completely sidelined completely by this other plot, by the lost kingdom plot, which is like, yeah, there's a, there was another kingdom of Atlantis full of like it, 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 called Mordor. And, uh, you know, the Lich King became the like one ring bearer. Yeah. It was just a, yeah, a hodgepodge is, uh, of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Right. It was like, oh, he's frozen. So it's like Lich King. He's like Sauron because he's got the headgear and he's got the Minas Morgul city. And it's just it was a lot of stuff that like didn't matter and failed to to uh, to grab. Like there's there's sequences where it's like, oh, man, like, you know, they steal like old Atlantean technology. The bad guys do. Yeah. And you know, like they have these fun submersibles that are also octopi. And I'm like, that's fun. Yeah. But then like the bridge of their ship is just a big soundstage, like, not even a soundstage, a big green screen where like just swaths of room where there's nothing like normally you just you fill the room with a bunch of complicated CG, like machinery. Or something. Nope. Just a big, it's like they're standing on a big stage at a high school production where, where the set designer quit halfway through the making of the movie, like, or, or, or the, the, the show. And it's just like, eh, nah. Like, yeah. And I couldn't care less about anything that were happening. I didn't like worry about anybody. You know, there's a moment where Aqua Baby gets kidnapped and you're just kind of like, well, they, they're not going to murder a baby in this PG-13 movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, not, and, and even if they did, that wouldn't make the movie better. Yeah. And I thought they did a fine job of cutting around. Oh, can't, cutting around anybody that might have been an issue. Yep. Yep. They sure did. I did. They didn't do what I thought they were going to do. Like, I thought it was still, the movie was still long. It was I still was long. Like, so, I'm like, this is still going. Like, did you do pickups? Did you add things in that you weren't going to have in? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, go ahead. it was a rough. But, uh, but yeah, like, the, the, you know, I will say, yeah, Patrick Wilson and uh, Aquaman were fun. I like watching Orm and Aquaman like do stuff together. Yeah. Um, Patrick Wilson was like, man, <laughs> that's what he was. <laughs> this poor guy. He's he like definitely like don't I, make me make another insidious movie, please. Come he on. was also like I felt like you know when he was on set with Momoa, Momoa was just like, well, I'm just being me, and he's like, but I'm an actor. <laughs> That's I, exactly what it felt I, like. And I feel like even though this is over, I I feel like I owe it to them to continue at least trying a bit. Yes, yes, and he <laughs> is. He's like my character is 
a displaced Atlantean prince who resents Aquaman and he doesn't live on the surface and he's been imprisoned for as many years as there have been between Aquaman one and two. And yeah. this, this motivates my character. And, and, and meanwhile, Aquaman's like, yeah, high five. And it's like, yeah, he would be like that. But like, but you fought him. I don't know. It's just, it was a lot. It was very, it, it felt like the longer the movie went on, obviously they don't usually shoot movies in, in order. In linear fashion, yeah. Um, and so there were some sequences where you could feel that like, clearly momo was just adding in random shit oh yeah and oh there's moments just, clearly just, where he's just like ah, how about i how about i don't care here's the sequence where aquaman drives a motorcycle and it's clearly just momoa's motorcycle or a motorcycle that maybe he had contractually hey did you see the clause that says like if i drive a car or ride anything or like wear something i get to keep it like so i i, I need i think a see i think this sequence needs a moment where in the montage i'm just doing donuts on like a rad hog and it's like that's that you are not being Aquaman. Like there's no, we do not establish at any point that Aquaman rides a motorcycle. That's just Jason Momoa driving a motorcycle. Yeah. And it's just for two seconds, but it's like emblematic of the whole movie where it's like, eh, nobody else is having fun. Only he's having fun because he's the star and he gets away with it. But like yeah. poor black Manta, like, you know, he doesn't get to do much. Uh, I mean, and like, and again, another like example of uh, like someone like, who's like, I'm in this movie. I'm, I'm trying. Yes. Randall Park is also just like, I don't know. Oh, I, yeah. I, I'm convinced he wasn't given a script. Like they were just like, well, you were in the office. Just to, just, to, just do some ad libs. One scene in one episode of the office, but still like you're an, you're a comedic actor. Just to, you know, yeah. Just do whatever, man. Who cares? We're, we're done. Dolph Lundgren's in it. And he's like, he's like, I'm sorry. I was in the last one. Like, do we, Oh, I'm just going to do what the lines say, you know, uh, <sighs> Yeah. Weird. Weird. Uh, uh, there was another moment. There's a moment in the movie where, uh, uh, oh, John Reese davies gets to come back as crab person. And he's fun because he's just John Reese davies And even he's like, I mean, he's only having fun in the booth. He's not even doing mocap. Like, no. he's just, oh, they cut off my hand. <laughs> and it's like, okay, Gimli, go for it. Yeah. But, uh, but the weird, the most vexing one was uh, Kingfish. Yes. The character of Kingfish, who looks, who looks better than this movie should have any right you know what i mean like fully cg character under the water and he looks amazing and i'm like yeah. god damn it but he's played by martin short and it was like for a minute we were like who's who is playing this guy like who's this character actor who's it is, is it paul giamatti like is it you know somebody that they were but it's martin short and i'm like look i love martin short as much as the next person you know as much as the next fan of late night but like why, why did you pick martin short <laughs> it's just such a weird decision i think we're gonna talk about is it topo what what's his name oh the the the, the, the octopus yes i don't know what the octopus cephalopod is yeah to yeah to i think you nailed it i think you remembered i think you committed to memory the name of the freaking octopus but yes it's topo is it are you sure i'm almost 100 percent positive <laughs> that was what they see horse in there and he's but fun was like he looked better than he should he looked great but it was like yeah we got this because there was like there are definitely some sequences where the effects were like oh that's rough oh, yeah no. oh but then other things i was like what yeah yeah so like that that poster that we showed you which was just part of it like two of three actors were really trying in it yes and the other one was like i'm gonna be lobo right well yeah well i'm coming back to this universe as lobo so so long folks yeah I, and by the way good because i if, if if the rumors are to be believed and jason momoa is gonna be lobo it is topo hooray wow like that, i really uh, did commit that to memory i'm apparently. telling you no i know yeah that's weird but uh but yeah it's it's so not like listen if you have literally nothing else that you want to see and don't for some see reason, it alone yeah 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 yeah. and you don't feel like you have to finish it we no did. or and and if there's a scene that you go like this is kind of going on skip it like just hit the skip button because i promise you like the, the skip button that That's like go, the way to, that accelerates you, at ten seconds because like I promise you you will miss nothing. Like there was a yeah. fight scene where he's fight where Orm's fighting one of those octopi and I just went mip and it, we lost nothing. Yeah. We just skipped ahead a little bit. Yeah. But like I felt the same way about Aquaman one. Like when they were doing the Lord of the Rings fight, like I remember just closing my eyes at one point because I was just like I just can't I can't look at all this stuff. And it was just like and I missed nothing. Yeah. Because it was like Aquaman is not about like Lord of the Rings fight scenes. It's about like aquaman yeah yeah, yeah. you know and, and it, admittedly yes yeah, someone mentioned like nicole kibben tried she did she was doing things. yeah she when was... her face wasn't being cg onto someone else's body yeah yeah she wanted she was just conf i feel like she was confused she's like wait why does no one care about what's happening in this movie 
Right. <laughs> I thought we were still well, making I, it. Especially if she had any like you know sequences with like um Amber Patrick Heard Wilson or... first, where he where she's like, okay, look, he's trying. Yes. Okay, yes. Oh yeah. This. No. Yeah. Oh okay. We're 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 still actors. How I... come? How come? No one. What, what? 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 Hello. Exactly. We come to this place for magic, <laughs> and then they changed it. I know. They, there's a new Nicole Kidman AMC theaters ad where her R's change and it's shorter. That's yeah. Cool. Anyway, Aquaman to the Lost Kingdom again. Watch it. This is one of those. Watch movies. it or don't. That's up to you. Watch it at home. Watch it on your phone. Doesn't matter. You miss nothing. And then we got to see, and it was mo- there was a moment where I was like, "This is the f- this is the last post credit scene in the DC EU." Oh yes. It was Patrick Wilson eating a cockroach, and I was like, "Yes, yep, nailed it." Yes. It's, wow, thank you. I completely forgot about that. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it's actually a pretty funny scene. I was like, eh, eh. like, there's nothing where I went, bah, this is horrible. Like, I was not offended in any way. I was just like either bemused or or uninterested. And there were a couple of moments where I like kind of chuckled, but not enough for me to in, for me to be endeared to it. I'll mm. never own this movie. I'll never watch it again. It just it happened. It, it, that's exactly what it is. That that's, this is a movie that happened. It happened before my eyes. And you can't unhappen it. That's correct. <laughs> what? <laughs> I was just looking at what it was. I didn't know. Yeah, but uh, let's jump into some comics that are coming out this week. Oh, what's your book of the out. week? Oh, my book of the week. Oh man, what a great question. Mine's um, the Flash. Obviously, yeah. No, I'm kidding. Uh, that's great. Yeah, mine was the Flash right? number six. Yeah, I loved it. Ah, uh, man. Even if it's like at times confusing. I, I think I gotta go Green Arrow number nine. There Cyber Rats, baby. All right, so what do you got for this week? What are you excited about? Uh, Batman 145 is coming out. We'll see okay. how that goes. Uh, you know, it's one thing or another. I don't know. Birds of Prey number seven is coming out. Now there's a there's a book. Nice. Uh, the Spectacular Spider-Man number one written by Gargoyle's creator Greg Wiseman. Uh, also create a uh, creative uh, force behind Spectacular Spider-Man, the cartoon series everyone mm-hmm. likes. Uh, Captain America number seven from uh, Babylon 5 creator J. Michael Straczynski is coming out. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Last Ronin 2 Re-Evolution number one will be dropping this week. And I think you should check it out if you love superhero comics. There you go. Um, and I think that's pretty much it as far as like my books are you concerned. Can, you can like bring up those. Other, I just pulled those. Oh, I should also mention uh, Aliens What If number one, I believe written in part by Paul Reiser is coming out. That's right. They're here. going to be applying the What If branding to other properties like their 20th Century Studios comics. Uh, this is uh, written by Hans Roy Rodinoff and Adam F. Goldberg and Paul Reiser and Leon Reiser and Brian Vol. Jesus how long how many friggin' writers do you need for what if burke didn't die in aliens uh with art by uh gu villanova well it's 40 pages maybe there's like a little backup good you know what i mean yeah that could be like that could explain why there's so many writers on right it. i i i don't know what what like what a weird um and phil noto did the cover yeah he did looks great yeah what fun. a weird pitch but i'm here for it I love the idea of using the what if brand on other things. As we pointed out in our star Wars infinities episode, so what if can go cross over into the aliens universe? Let's have uh, Marvel finally do those. What if star Wars books? Mm-hmm. So that's on there. Cool. I didn't know what this was. Oh, well, Marvel's unlo- unleashing their free Marvel must haves collections. So this includes things like Spider-Man Deadpool. Isn't it romantic? The first issue of that uh, run. Uh, so this is like a, 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 an attempt by Marvel to get people to read effing comic books oh, wow. by introducing them to like some of their like biggest and, uh, you know, most fan favorite uh, stories. So this is a free. Is it printed? I don't know. Or is it digital only? I assume it's digital only, but okay. I don't know. But you can find it. It's, you can pick it's, it up. It's, you know, it's it's the book. It's it's essentially like a reprint. Yeah. If it's digital, it's weird to say that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's great. Yeah. And if you were, if you skipped Deadpool Spider-Man, Joe Kelly and Ed McGinnis, top of the game. Great stuff. It's a good book. That's awesome. What'd you read? Or what are you going to read? Um, well, I noticed Ms. Marvel uh, Mutant Menace is coming out. Um, I'll, I'll check in because it has Fall of the House of X book. Sure. Um, that's written by Sabir uh, Prizada with, uh, and also Iman Vellani with art by uh, Scott Godlewski. Um, So I'd like to check in. I'm like, 
I like Amon's um, love of this character. So yeah. apparently will be in print. Uh, the the Marvel must have. Fantastic. Wow. That's great. And I threw this up for both of us or for you. Oh, yeah. This is a black label book that's mm-hmm. coming out. Go ahead. The Batman First Night. Uh, it's basically an Elseworlds book that says like, hey, um, what if Batman started in like 1939? Mm. Uh, written by Dan Jorgens, by Mike Perkins. Uh I, I I love the cover and I love the concept and I just love the decisions to make these. So let's do it. Let's see where it goes. Yeah. Um, I believe it's a black label book, but it is. it's, it's also, it says down there. yeah, no, well, I heard they were bringing about the Elseworlds line and I remember them saying a bunch of books were going to be Elseworlds. This could have been one of them. Sure. But if it was already along, especially if it's over, if it's like a specific set of dimensions, which is associated with black label and not Elseworlds, yes. it would be too far down. Totally. For them to, to switch that yeah. up. But why not do like a period piece oh, sure. for Batman yeah. in the time from which he came? Exactly. Neat. Uh, for me, also, X-Men number 32 is coming out next week. Yeah, that's happening. Of course. Uh, Doctor Strange number 13 will be coming out. Um, this is that one where it's, uh, you know, sentient role playing game is transferred to New York, uh, transformed to New York, New York. And we have uh, Doctor Strange gathering a team of uh, secret defenders. Uh, Yay. Which is super exciting. Is this it? It is. Did it. Look at that. Yes. Awesome. I love it. I'm, I'm here for it. Um, and then last, but certainly, certainly not least, Ultimate X-Men number one will be coming out this week um, by Peach Momoko. Entirely. Entirely. Well, she didn't letter it, but. No. <laughs> Travis there, Lanham did that. Uh, yeah. And there's also a translator involved. Of course. Which is excellent. Um, yeah. I'm I'm excited for this. I'm thrilled. Um, this is going to be a 40 page launch of this series. And uh, I can't wait to see what Peach brings to the table. Uh, you know, as you know, she you know, knows something about the X-Men thanks to having done a few things um, in the past, you know, her own spin, for the demon, demon days. days and other such things. Um, so she's, you're going to really be getting, you know, a new take on, on these characters. And if that's really what you want, trust me, you, there are a lot worse places you can go than the world that Peach Momoko uh, sees. Uh, she's a really incredible artist, very different, very yes. different. But if you like her covers, trust me, her interiors are just that. So fantastic. Cannot wait. Cannot wait. Cannot wait. Cannot wait. Uh, we also want to, of course, thank our super chatters for sponsoring mm-hmm. today's show and uh, our chat for keeping it cool in the chat. Uh, I swear there was one in the chat, but then it wasn't in the starred. I know. So I don't know what that's all about. I don't either. Isn't that weird? It is weird. But uh, we will. We uh, really, really appreciate you guys showing up every. Uh, oh, yeah, here it is. Is this Bear Farmer? Got sucked into video games a little too hard and missed the start, but I'll rewatch later. Hope you guys consider doing Batman Last Night on Earth. Would love to see Ethan's reaction. Yeah, and then one day we'll do that. But, uh, uh, but that's... I, I hope you're defending Super Earth. <laughs> of course uh but yeah we want to thank you so much for hanging out with us and uh for mm-hmm. checking out this show if you want more tiffany's playing uh, hell divers 2 on stream typically on twitch.tv slash comic pop or youtube.com at comic pop plays uh of course there's more here uh josh williamson and i are going to be shooting all stars on uh wednesday so that'll drop on tuesday of next week but uh, that's not the end of the content here at youtube.com slash comic pop returns or over on our sister channel, comic pop prime. Uh, we're going to be doing an episode uh, from a more recently released series, predator versus Wolverine. So Ooh, uh, check exciting. out that episode. And of course, uh, if you want more like the video, subscribe to the channel. And if you want to help us more directly, you can go to patreoncom slash comic pop to help us there directly. Uh, but the super chats, the watching the shows, the likes, the subscriptions, that's, that's enough for us. We do appreciate all mm-hmm. that you do and more. Uh, and we'll see you guys next time with another episode here on, uh, off the rack. I'm Sal. I'm Tiffany. So long everybody. For democracy. <laughs> mm.